Hi, I'm Edward Andrews. I'm part of the team who conduct worship in the linked charges with St Michael's Parish Church, Dallas, Rafford Parish Church and St Leonard's Parish Church, Forest, Moray, Scotland. Welcome to our online service, wherever and whenever you're joining with us. I hope that you all had a blessed and peaceful Christmas and that the season brought all to you that you hoped for. Today is the first Sunday in Christmas, but today I'm going to cheat. Yes, we will be singing Christmas carols, but I'm going to change the subject. Today we will be celebrating St Stephen, which is why I'm wearing a red stole, as it's the feast of a martyr. I'm Irish, and while the community from which I was reared celebrated Boxing Day, I had a girlfriend who was from Fermanagh, and when I went over to visit after Christmas one year, I heard stories of how the mummers had been, and for the Wren boys came on St Stephen's Day. Most of Ireland, in fact, call Boxing Day St Stephen's Day, and the Wren boys or mummers acted out folklore stories about the relationship between Jesus and Wrens. Now the history of why the day after Christmas Day is dedicated to St Stephen, proto-martyr, is a wee bit confusing, but today I'd like to simplify it a wee bit. For whatever reason, by the 5th century, the Feast of Stephen was the day after the Feast of the Nativity, Christmas Day. I would suggest that the reason for this was that after the joy and the delight that Christ had been born, it was necessary for people to understand that by embracing Christ, they could in fact have suffer a death sentence. Actually, it's quite interesting to read the literature about the life of the early church. Life in the Roman Empire for the early church seems to have been much more a case of intermittent, vicious persecution separated by long terms of relative peace. The problem was that the Christians were, after the first century or two, when they had grown a bit, a useful minority who could be blamed for any problems and hence be persecuted. On the first Sunday of Christmas in this year, the lectionary takes us to the temple when Jesus was 12. I thought about using this story, but then I thought that it's a classic story about Jesus. When I feel the important thing as the people of God is how we learn what Jesus was demanding of his people. The Gospel for the commemoration of St Stephen, Putro Martyr, is from the Gospel according to Matthew and gives us the words of Christ. Oh yes, we will celebrate the birth of Christ, remember his birth and the events of that night, especially this year as we're taking Luke as our key gospel. So we have a story of the shepherds and the manger. So let us reflect on the story that Christ was born in Bethlehem. Glory to you, almighty God, for you sent your only begotten Son, that we might have new life. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for you became flesh and dwelt among us, that we might become your people. Glory be to you, Holy Spirit, for, the, for you direct and rule our lives. Glory to you, Almighty God, and to your Son, Jesus Christ, and to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Because our Gospel for the year is from Luke, and he had the story of the shepherds, we're going to sing what is the old paraphrase which was sung before the Kirk discovered Christmas, while humble shepherds watched their flocks. Old paraphrase 37, which is found as hymn 296.
Let us adore God, Creator, Son and Spirit. Let us pray. A loving God, we join in the songs of choirs as we reflect on that great Christmas carol. O come, let us adore him. Not just the faithful, the people who are comfortable with the well-worn, well-loved ritual of Christmas, but the unfaithful, the people who are asking questions, the people who have never seriously thought about the real meaning of Christmas. God, we adore you. We're here in amazement and wonder at your patience through generation after generation. Again and again you have given you could have given up on your people, but have you renewed your covenant constantly? At Christmas we're reminded of this miracle, for the miracle has come to stay. Let us adore God, the creator of the universe. O oh, come, let us adore him. Jesus, we adore you, fragile child in a frightening world. With shepherds, we kneel in wonder. With travellers, we look in on amazement. For you are a sign that we are adored by God, precious to him, worthy of a future. Let us adore Jesus Christ the Lord. O oh, come, let us adore him. Holy Spirit, we adore you. By your power, the life of God is moved among us. You create newborn opportunities before our eyes. You entered a mother's heart, a father's soul, and sow seeds of eternal hope. You moved in nations and kingdoms to transform history into a new era. Because of you, Mothers, fathers, children will never be the same, for we all shall be changed. Let us adore the Holy Spirit, life-giver and transformer. O oh, come, let us adore her. And yet, Lord, there's always a yet. Yet we know that we fail in what you've called us to be. We're not loving of ourselves let alone our neighbours or our enemies. Our service to you is intermittent and half-hearted. We don't concentrate on the important things. Forgive us when we get things wrong, but most importantly, grant that we may know the assurance that we're forgiven, so we can grow as real human beings who know our potential through the love and the work of Jesus Christ the baby of Bethlehem, your Son, our Lord. Build us up, we ask you, in spiritual grace, that we may know you and experience your power in our lives. Heavenly Father, give us grace in all our sufferings for the truth, to follow the example of your martyr, St Stephen, that we also may look to him who was crucified and pray for those who persecute us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen for the word of God. First of all, it's contained in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 26, reading from verse 1 to verse 6 and from verse 10 to verse 15. Early in the reign of Jacohim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, the word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I commanded you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my love which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, 
though you have not listened. Then I will make this house like Shiloh and this city a curse among all the nations of the earth. But when the officials of Judah heard about these things, they, were, they went up from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their places at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and all the people, This man should be sentenced to death because he has prophesied against the city. You've heard it with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all these things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. As for me, I'm in your hands. Do with me whatever you think is good and right. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city, on those who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. And again, listen for the word of God, this time as it's contained in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, from verse 51 to verse 59. Stephen said to the Sanhedrin, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You, who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. The gradual is Psalm 100, we sing part of it as hymn 65, Jubilati, everyone.
Holy Gospel is found in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 23, reading from verse 34 to verse 39. Jesus said, Therefore I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify, others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berketh, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thanks be to God for the glorious gospel. Good King Wenceslas, when he went out on the feast of Stephen, was, rather than following the whim to take goodies to the poor man who was picking windfall up in the forest, was carrying out his duty as a Christian, and most expressly as a Christian monarch. The song ends with the lesson, Therefore Christian men be sure, whether or rank possessing, wealth or rank possessing, Ye who now will bless the poor shall yourselves find blessing. Wenceslas was traditionally believed to represent all that a Christian monarch should be, and part of the duty of the Christian monarch, or any Christian, was generosity to the poor. But why on the feast of Stephen? Stephen gets quite a lot of write-up in the book of Acts. Two whole chapters of the book are devoted to him. He's described as being a man full of God's grace and power. And the story begins with a division in the early church between those who came from a Hebrew-speaking background and those from a Greek-speaking background. This was over the daily distribution of food to the poor, the widows. The Greek-speaking Jews thought that they were being shortchanged very wisely, the twelve, the closest associates of Jesus, sidestepped the issue and had other people appointed to look after this, which was vital work. Because remember, it says in Acts that they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. These seven people, by their names probably mainly Greek-speaking Christians, were given the responsibility of looking after the material needs of the community. But notice, it includes Philip, who is recorded as having evangelised the Ethiopian eunuch, and Stephen, who was perfectly capable of giving an account of his faith when challenged. It was a result of the speech to the Sanhedrin the longest speech recorded in the book of Acts, the closing words of which we read as our second reading, that he was stoned. Much later than apostolic times, when people were elaborating the stories about the saints, Stephen as one of the people who was responsible for this fair distribution of the resources of the early Christian community was perceived as being good to the poor. And from that, especially as the day on which his life was celebrated was so near Christmas, it was easy to see his day as a day not so much for the exchange of gifts, but for charity to the poor. Now there's no doubt that it's important to remember people for their generosity. But when we look at the readings for today, we find that we're going further than that. I would suggest it's because while generosity is a good thing, 
the two real issues which we find today is justice and the whole question of martyrdom. The background to the martyrdom of Stephen is actually quite predictable. He was clearly a person of talent, a man full of God's grace and power, and opposition arose from members of the synagogue of freedmen who appear to have been Greek-speaking Jews. Perhaps they were the fellowship that Stephen had been involved in before his conversion to Christianity. Clearly he saw them off with arguments, so they set him up with informers and stirred up the mob and brought him to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. And there his speech so enraged the mob that effectively he was lynched. The martyrdom of Stephen was an important event in the history of the church. For the killing of Stephen triggered a general persecution which resulted in a widespread dispersal of the church. And the result of this was that what had been a Jewish sect expecting the return of their Messiah in the near future became a movement which spread around what we would roughly think of as the Near East and then as was geographically certain up to the north into Europe but while we think of the move into Europe and eventually to Rome Christians also went into Asia only partially displaced by the actions of Islam 700 years later and there's still Christians about who trace their history to the actions of a passing apostle but unfortunately because of what the West has done in the last 30 years or so some of these historic churches are confused with Western Christianity and are being persecuted and may die out. And it's the persecution of the church which is where I believe that any meditation on Stephen has to concentrate. The church persecuted. There seem to me to be two main reasons why the church, or to be more exact Christians, are persecuted. Christians in many countries are countercultural. A society has a certain understanding of matters eternal. It doesn't matter what the basic faith community is, Christians challenge it. The early Christians were treated with suspicion because they would not sacrifice to the emperor. They refused to take part in the cultural life of the empire. Today, in many societies, contemporary Christians are treated with suspicion because they are other than the dominant faith and the culture. doesn't matter if it's Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. Don't worry, we did the same not so much in Scotland, at least after the Reformation, for Reformed Christians had a high regard for our elder brothers in the faith, the Jews. But in the countries of the British Isles, there was historically an awful lot of anti-Semitism because the Jews were the only non-Christian religious minority in large quantities. In the context of minority Christians, we in the West should be supporting our brothers and sisters in the faith and be encouraging our political leaders to lose diplomatic means to alleviate the plight of minority Christians. Mind you, it can be quite bewildering in the ins and outs, but it's important that what is left of Christendom supports other Christians. But the other danger of persecution is in a situation where people within the culture challenge it from their understanding of the faith. And that's where we find the model takes us back to the Hebrew Bible, to the prophets, Jeremiah, I've got to declare my prejudice, but probably Jeremiah is the prophet I resonate with most. Jeremiah was the prophet who not only kept telling the powers that be what was going to happen if they continued in their political and religious politics, but who was constantly persecuted for doing so. Yes, the plight of the persecuted church is an issue which, which we, living in relative freedom, have to be aware of. 
perhaps we also have to be aware of the tensions which there are between the faith and the culture in which we live. And it's at this stage that it's important that we understand what martyrdom means. The root of the word martyr is the Greek word martes, witness. And over the years we've lost sight of the primary meaning of the word and have reserved it for the most extreme form of witness, death. In a way, whether we've ever heard of it or not, we've taken on board so much of what George Bernard Shaw wrote in the play Andocles and the Lion. But Shaw, a sceptic, died aged over 90 in 1950, and while he's sometimes considered as playwright second only to Shakespeare, we must not let his views affect our understanding of what we are called to do as witnesses to the faith in the 20th, 21st century. No matter what a society claims to be based on, its observation of the faith will be distorted and imperfect. We saw this in 6th century BC Judah with the story we read from the book of Jeremiah and we've seen it in Christendom where there were gross inequalities and injustices and today in the time of post-Christendom, in a society about which people can write about the nosedive in church membership, church going, religious marriage and baptism, the puritanical regime of old Scots religion died with little fuss, fluttering to the ground, lighter than the house of cards. And those who are involved in the kirk in any meaningful way will be aware of the struggle of the institution to survive. What does that say to us? This eclectic online community of faith with people across the world, each in our own different situation, bound together by electronics and the Holy Spirit. God is not going to leave himself without witnesses, martyrs. In any community, we may be few, but our task is to demonstrate the real meaning of the good news which Jesus brought. In our secular society, we're going to be judged by the quality of our witness rather than the profundity of our beliefs. The child of yesterday became the man of the future who taught people that the kingdom of God is at hand and was persecuted and killed for his pains. Stephen was so sure of the love and the power of God available to the people of Israel that he was prepared to outface its official leaders even if it brought about his death. How are we going to show the love and the generosity of God in our witnessing to Christ? Child, adult, dead, risen and ascended, our Lord and our God. Now the hymn we're going to have is an unusual one. It's called First of Martyrs, Thou Whose Name. It was written in Latin for St Stephen's Day by J.B. de Statuel, who was a French poet who wrote in Latin in the 17th century and translated by Isaac Williams, a 19th century divine who was involved in the Oxford movement. It appears in Source Ancient um, Hymns Ancient and Modern, the nineteen twenty two edition.
let us pray. Loving God, may the worship we have shared this Christmas lead to acts of service which transform people's lives. May the carols we have sung this Christmas help others to sing even in their sadness. May the gifts we have exchanged this Christmas deepened our spirit of giving throughout the year. May the candles we have lit this Christmas remind us that you intend no one to live in darkness. May the isolation and restrictions in which we have lived this Christian this Christmas remind us we are all responsible for other people and that we shall love our neighbour. May the stories we have told again this Christmas be good news of great joy to us and all people on our lips and in our lives. May the ways God has come close to us this Christmas not be forgotten but hidden in our memories be a rich resource to us to lift us up when times are painful and humble us when things go well for God is our life our light, our salvation, this season and always, because of Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal God, we bring to you the situation in Afghanistan in prayers, but we realise much of what we're praying for now in Afghanistan is also appropriate for other places in the world where there's deprivation and military conflict. Come, Jesus, come our Saviour, Come to all the people of Afghanistan in this bleakest of winters. Come with food and water to feed the hungry and refresh the thirsty ones. Come, once a child yourself, come to the children and the babies when so many cry with hunger pangs and parents would give everything to feed them. Come the peace bearer. Come and bring your shalom to this land after 40 years of brittle war. Come to those displaced and uprooted, to a people fearful and vulnerable to violence. Come, the light of our night, come to families cold and shivering, when infection passes from one to another, while the economy is broken and creation groans in pain. For all people of all faiths, to all children of every family, in all the places where mothers weep and children cry, come. God made vulnerable flesh to touch your world with true hope once more. Turn our sorrow at the suffering of children and a determination that hate will not win into something we can do. Take the money we give and the prayers we pray and stir in us and all your people wherever it's needed for a new world to come. From the depths of a bitter winter may hope spring. We hold before you our special intercessions. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come unto you. We hold up before you the world suffering from the pandemic while our focus is on our own concerns. Help us to understand that this affects everyone in the world and that we're all interacted. Keep, give wisdom and generosity to the world community that the poorest and the least able parts of the world may be supported as much as we are. We remember our friends who are now with you in your love where there is no more pain or loss. Support us in our time, that we may rejoice in the life eternal, in expectation. We now combine our prayers in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. While we've generally been thinking of St Stephen today, we must still remember that Christ was born in Bethlehem and that love did come down at Christmas. 
and that's what we're going to sing love came down at christmas May we remember the demands and dangers of the faith that we may witness wherever we are to the love and the power of Jesus Christ our Lord. May we follow the example of the heroic witnesses to the inbreaking of the kingdom who have gone on from this world to serve God in the next. And may we be faithful in everything which we do in service and love as the people of God and his way. And with the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us all today and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for joining in our worship. I wish you a happy, healthy and blessed week. God bless.